Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for a panel discussion hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAST. My name is Ariel Ligi, and I'm CCAST's Grassland Community of Practice Coordinator, and I sit in Tucson, Arizona, based out of the University of Arizona here. I'll be joined today by Carly Jewell, who will be helping me uh, facilitate this webinar, and, um, and also Katie Boyer, who's here from the Fish and Wildlife Service. And we'll be hearing from Dr. Diane Larson and from Dr. Lauren DiCarlo. For folks who are new to CCAST, CCAST supports issue-based instead of geography-based conservation by facilitating peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange through case studies, webinars, and workshops. These activities support the development of communities of practice focused on grassland restoration, non-native aquatic species, aquatic restoration, and drought and climate adaptation. Um, I wanna add a little final reminder at this point that we're gonna follow this discussion by a Q&A session. And as we go along, please make use of the chat to put any of your questions in there. We'll have a little bit of time for reflection between the presentations um, and we'll get to all of those questions after our presentations and look forward to hearing from everyone there. Um, we're gonna start today from hearing uh, about the research that Lauren DiCarlo has, has shared with us. Um, Lauren DiCarlo is an assistant professor in the Environmental Science Department at Westfield State University. Dr. DiCarlo has studied in semi-arid grasslands for nearly a decade and her research will take it away Lauren feel free to share your screen and, and um, yeah take it away all right thank you um hopefully you can see that uh so thanks for having me I'm Lauren DiCarlo I um and am a professor at Westfield State University in Massachusetts and today I'm going to be presenting some work uh, I've done in collaboration with Sandy DeBaino at Oregon State and also Skylar Burroughs at the USDA B Lab at Utah State. Um, so today I'm presenting some research actually that's not published, but we do have uh, past publications that you might be interested in, um, focused both on bees. So we work a lot in grassland restoration. Um, but we focus on beneficial invertebrates. So we have some work also with spiders and we've done some work with uh, some mammalian herbivores as well and some overlap with pollinators. So um, just a brief history of North American grasslands. Um, since European settlement, over 99% of grasslands have declined in North America, primarily due to agricultural conversion. Uh, but currently the threats we see on many of the grasslands, especially in the Pacific Northwest are altered fire regimes. Um, and we've actually seen some wildfires in our sites. Also woody encroachment by shrubs and invasions by annual grasses. Looking at the photo on the right, here's a photo of a pretty intact grassland. So you have the bunch grasses, there's spaces in between. Those spaces are generally filled with biological soil crust, so things like lichens and cyanobacteria that create a crust over the soil and can help protect the soil from erosion. Uh, many of our grasslands, though, are disturbed and look something like this. So you don't see those bunch grasses, you don't see the spaces in between. Here um, is an area, and this is one of our study sites, where there's an invasion of annual grasses. So here, both cheatgrass and medusa head. And so due to these different threats, there's been a huge push, um, especially in the Pacific Northwest in the past decade to restore some of these grassland habitats, primarily for endangered species. And many plants, so rare plants and endangered species have been monitored in these grasslands, but we know very little about how this, these grassland restoration projects are impacting pollinators. Um, so we're interested specifically in knowing how are these restoration projects impacting the native bee communities? What variables might be associated with these communities? Um, and like I said, we don't really know very much about the native bee community. So 
what species actually are present on these sites. And knowing more about pollinators can be really beneficial to the, this restoration process as um, there's many rare plants that can be found in, in grasslands and bees can provide a huge service with pollination. So thinking about some of the variables that might be associated with bees in these grasslands, it could be something like floral abundance or diversity, it might be vegetation height, depending on what um, bees like to for, uh, forage on, and then also nesting resources. So many of the bees um, that we find in these systems are uh, solitary nesters and they nest directly into the soil. So we have three main objectives. So we wanted to describe the bee communities that were present in these uh, semi-arid grasslands. We wanted to assess the habitat variables that were most strongly associated with these bee communities and also determine how grassland restoration is impacting um, the bee communities at a regional scale. So we looked at three different study sites across eastern Oregon. Uh, these sites are pretty similar. They get um, about 20 centimeters of rain a year. So they're on the arid to semi-arid side. Um, and I'm going to go into each one. So the first is a uh, the Umatilla National Wildlife Refuge. This is a pretty large arid grassland. Historically, it was both grazed and cultivated. You can see it's still cultivated in some areas today. Um, so this site has done a few different restoration projects in the past decade, primarily trying to convert from agriculture back to native grassland. And the native bunch grasses on these sites are all similar. So blue bunch wheatgrass, needle and thread grass, Sandberg's bluegrass are the most dominant. And we see very similar uh, invasive grass species, so cheatgrass and medusa head. We also looked at the Nature Conservancy Boardman Preserve. So this is an area that was also historically grazed. It's no longer grazed, um, but also has an interesting history where it was used as a naval bombing range. So there's large areas of intact grassland that were never cultivated, and it has very similar, again, species to the last, the Umatilla Wildlife Refuge. And then the Nature Conservancy has another large area that they've been doing grassland restoration work on, um, which is the Zumal Prairie. So historically also grazed and cultivated, it's still grazed in some areas. Um, similar native bunch grasses, the only difference is here, the exotic species also include intermediate wheatgrass and ventanata. Um, all three sites uh, have done multiple restoration projects and um, primarily they have gone through used an herbicide to kill off the invasive grass species, got, come back through with a range drill, seeded native bunch grasses, um, and maybe also a few flowering plants. So um, we collected bees at each of these locations using elevated pan traps. Pan traps are just small cups that are painted flu fluorescent yellow, blue, and white. They attract different pollinators or different bee species with these different colors. And they're filled with water and detergent. We left them out in the field for two days and we had three collection times. So we did an early, mid, and late season. So June to July, July to August, August, September. And uh, we did this in 2015. And so we had multiple plots at each of these sites. So we were able to identify areas that were degraded, so highly invaded with those invasive grasses, um, intact or native, so have those bunch grasses, and then areas that had been restored either by the Nature Conservancy or the Wildlife Refuge. And in all of our plots, we had nine of those elevated pan traps, and around them, in a 50 by 50 meter square, we were able to count and identify every single species that was flowering at the time of our bee collection. And we also did vegetation surveys um, within this 50 by 50 meter square. 
focusing specifically on um, the average percent invasive annual grass, litter, biological soil crust, and forb cover. And we also measured maximum vegetation height. So what do we find? So after just three short um, sampling periods, we collected over 6,000 bees and identified 90 species from five different families. Primarily, we found um, most of our bees came from the Helictidae family. So this is the sweat bee family. Um, you can see three of these um, on the side. So the Agapossumum, Lasioglossum, and Helictus. We also found some longhorned bees as well. So these are from the Apidae family. Uh, and the Melisodes is a known um, specialist on asters. Generally, um, not a lot is known about many of the sweat bee species that we collected, but um, they're more known to be generalists. So during that, that time period where we collected bees, we also collected or identified um, over 17,000 blooming stems in our plots, and about 15% of those were non-native. And we identified them to 63 species. Uh, most commonly, we found plants that were in the aster family. And some of those common species were common yarrow, uh, slender sinkfoil, also Idaho gumweed. So looking at how restoration impacted uh, the bee communities. So uh, we actually did not find any difference between bee abundance, richness, or diversity between our three treatments. So those treatments being degraded, um, so still invaded with invasive grasses, native or intact areas, and then the restored treatments. However, we did find a difference between the bee communities. So the composition that was found in each of these treatments. Um, and what we found was that there was a very different composition in the native plots compared to the degraded and restored. So the communities in the degraded and restored did not differ from each other. Uh, looking at how uh, these treatments, so the restoration treatment impacted uh, habitat variables, we see similar trends where, for example, with invasive grasses um, or litter, we're seeing that the percent cover of that in the degraded and restored don't differ from each other. However, there is lower amounts of invasive annual grass litter and litter in the native sites. Um, and then there's also a change in the biological soil crust cover. So there's higher biological soil crust in the native sites than in either the degraded or restored sites. Um, biological soil crusts are really interesting in this area where after a disturbance, some crusts may be able to recover quite quickly, but other crusts are known to take up to 250 years to recover. Um, so this might be something that takes a lot longer than, you know, a decade or two after restoration. Um, vegetation height and forb cover, we didn't find any difference uh, between any of the treatments. Uh, but what we think is happening here is that with the restoration, the grassland restoration treatments, what it, when the um, prescription or the treatment is happening, big changes in the invasive annual grasses and the litter cover is not is not bringing it back to those native levels. So bees that might want to um, nest in the ground may not have access to these areas if there's a lot of grass cover or a lot of litter cover. And one other thing I wanted to mention too is in the study, so looking at this at a regional level, we found a really strong relationship between total bee richness and total floral richness. Um, you would think that's a given. So like obviously if there's more um, floral resources, there would be more bees, but this actually isn't always the case. It's this relationship seems to be much more nuanced. So if we look at individual sites, 
we actually don't see this relationship. And other researchers um, in some studies that have been published may have found this uh, relationship or they may have not found any relationship between bee richness and floral richness. Same for like bee abundance and floral abundance. So uh, general conclusions, um, we found that bees were pretty useful for monitoring restoration techniques where maybe uh, current grassland restoration practices are not restoring habitat to allow for pollinators um, to move back into the area. Uh, so those restored areas are not yet mimicking native areas. And then um, thinking about how to improve this and thinking about how to change grassland restoration prescription treatments, um, thinking more about nesting habitat. So maybe being able to reduce that litter or being able to increase the number of forbs or flowering plants that are seeded. And so with that, um, I just wanna acknowledge we've had a lot of support um, and funding for this and a lot of people have, have uh, contributed to this project. All right, with that, thank you. And I can stop sharing. Thank you so much, Lauren. Diane, as, uh, as you switch over to, to sharing your presentation, um, yeah, I'd encourage everybody who's listening in to put any questions for Lauren into the chat or questions that you might have for other folks on this call. Um, yeah, if anybody has experience increasing uh, nesting cover and grassland restoration, we'd love to hear from y'all during the, the discussion. Um, if the folks have questions about how to do that, drop that into the chat, things like that. Um, so yeah, without further ado, uh, Diane, I'll pass it to you. Okay, can you see and or hear me now? <laughs> I hope. Yeah, you're looking great. Okay, and great, thank you. Um, so what, I, what I'm going to talk to you about are a series of studies that were done over about uh, 2010 to 2017 at Badlands National Park. And what I'm interested in is how does presence of an invasive plant or its renewal affect pollinators? So the value of removal we often take for, of invasive plants, we often take for granted that of course that's a good thing. But without understanding how that species um, functions within the community it's, it's in, that can be risky to just remove it without making sure that um, it's got a replacement that is acceptable. Um, so um, especially if that plant has been established over many generations as most of our invasives have been. So this is um, Badlands National Park in South Dakota. It I'm just showing you the locations of our study sites. Um, the park itself is made up of two basic vegetation types, the western wheatgrass prairie and the sparse vegetation. And we have study sites in each of those, um, about equally divided between those two um, types of vegetation. This is my method slide. Um, it's pretty simple. What we do is go out in the field and we have plots set up as you saw in the last um, in the last slide. We collect insect species that we find that are it, uh, that are in contact with the reproductive parts of flowers. Then we we identify that insect, pin it, and remove the pollen that it has collected during its foraging bout. So we know not only the flower it was collected on, but what, it, what resources it's been using during that particular foraging bout. And the result of all that is that we get, as you see here, hopefully, I don't know if you can see. Okay, so this is what you wind up with is, is a, a network analysis basically that connects all of the different players, the plants and the insects. 
and shows you who's sharing pollinators with whom and plants with whom, that sort of thing. And I'll, I'll show you a bigger example of that later, but just to go, just to show you what we're headed for. <clears throat> the really important thing that we look at in this network analysis is um, modularity. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about the rest of the time. So um, modularity are basically, Modules are the building blocks of networks. So the plants and insects that interact more with each other than with other members of the network are said to form a module. And there are three types of, of actors. The hub, which is uh, linked to almost all the members, well, linked to every member in the module. The connectors, which connect the modules one to another. And the peripherals, which really don't have very many links to anything. They could be rare, they could just be poorly sampled, um, but they're basically connected just to the hub. So the, the importance of modules is that they can prevent perturbations from propagating through an entire network. For example, if you look at this, this is a module, this is a module, and this is a module. This one, if this, for example, was an invasive species, this hub species, if it was controlled, this, this module might just go away. But that module going away is not gonna really affect these other modules because it's very weakly connected to the others. So if we increase the proportion of connectors, these triangles, that can more tightly link the modules and that can cause stabilization of the network, which in generally might, general might be a good thing, but it also allows disturbances to propagate more through the, the entire network. So the first study was how, how would control of Canada thistle affect the plant pollinator interactions? So we measured the interactions before removal of Canada thistle. And this is at the height of its flowering. So we were measuring what was visiting in sites that were infested and in sites that were not infested. And then we measured interactions after removal or senescence of the Canada thistle. So what we found was that this is increasing modularity, and this is a sample period from early to late in the season. This was after removal or senescence, and this was before removal or senescence. The dark bars are the non-infested sites. They were not infested by Canada thistle. They might have other invasives, but they didn't have Canada thistle. And the gray bars are the ones that were infested by Canada thistle. And what's really obvious is that over time, as Canada thistle declined and was removed. Um, we saw a, a strong decline in modularity that we did not see in the sites that were not infested with Canada thistle. So what was happening is that these connectors that were visiting Canada thistle were able to move to different species and that tightened that network and reduced the modularity that there weren't so many separate modules, they were more connected to each other. So the implications of this, um, first Canada thistle did increase the stability of our plant pollinator network. The connectors were very, were pro proliferated after the removal or senescence. It's not that different species came in, species that maybe weren't connectors before became connectors because they had to switch, right? Um, so there was more opportunities to rescue some of the rare interactions as they moved to other plants. Um, but that led to more opportunities for disturbance to propagate through the entire network. But the big deal is that rewiring happened. So lots of insects are generalists. And when there was a decline in one species, they could move to others. The key thing from a management perspective is you got to provide those other species so that those insects have something to visit when you control um, the invasive that you no longer want. So um, thistle isn't the only invasive species at Badlands. Sweet clover is another huge invasive at Badlands National Park. 
and its its seeds um, require scarification um, to germinate. It's a biennial, so when there's a really good a good season for scarification, you can get just incredible blooms of Canada thistle. It's very thick. I'm sorry, not Canada thistle, sweet clover, and it's so. We were wondering what effect that might have. Um, and we looked back at the same sites we were looking at at the Canada thistle in and looked to see what is the effect of sweet clover, what what role did it play in those same modules that we we were looking at with with Canada thistle. So again, Sweet clover was a hub species. In other words, it was very important in the structuring of those plant pollinator communities. Um, and it was it happened whether or not it was infested, the site was infested with Canada thistle. So looking at throughout the season, infested and non-infested hub species included sweet clover every time, no matter what. So it's a it's an incredibly important species when it's when it's present. And actually, even when it's not a super good sweet clover year, you still get sweet clover as a hub species. So it's a very important component. It's structuring the pollinator communities and its removal is gonna have implications for insects that rely on pollen or nectar. And there's a species Calliopsis andreniformis, it's a legume specialist, and it relies heavily on sweet clover. So the last study I'm going to describe to you um, looks at Dakota buckwheat, Ariaganum vicheri. It's an annual and it's endemic. And the endemics are very uncommon in the Great Plains. So this is something that Badlands, the park is really interested in, in uh, making sure that it, that it thrives. And they're worried about invasive species. So this is, a bigger chunk of the network analysis of Ariaganum vicheri, asking would sweet clover be um, likely to be having, causing problems for pollination of Ariaganum vicheri. And in fact, what we found was that sweet clover, Melalosa officinalis, doesn't even occupy the same, um, the same module as Ariaganum vicheri. Therefore, it's not really sharing pollinators with this species to any great extent. What we did find, however, is that Salsola tragus, which is Russian thistle, another invasive plant, was within the same module as Ariaganum vicheri, and therefore it would be sharing pollinators. So that is probably more of a concern than Melolotus. So to look, the, the implications of that, first of all, sweet clover, again, we found it was um, a hub species and a very important organizational component of this, these flower visitor networks. But endemic Vischer's buckwheat shared very few insect visitors with sweet clover. So that's not an issue, but Russian thistle could be. So we wanted to then ask how do shared visitors affect seed set of Vischer's buckwheat? And this leads me to our last, this was an experimental approach we took in the field. This is the little flower <laughs> that's um, interesting to try to hand pollinate, but we did. We added Ariaganum vicheri conspecific pollen. We let, added Melolotus pollen, Russian thistle pollen, uh, acongeners pollen, or we left it open pollinated. And these will self, I should say. So, and what did we find? We found no difference. This is the akene weight, uh, the little seed that it produces over time. They all declined at the same rate over time, which you would expect over the season, but there were no differences in um, those treatments. So adding pollen from non-native species, either of the non-native species or anything else for that matter, didn't affect seed, the seed weight. So, um, I'll leave you with a couple of, of observations. First, sweet clover and Canada thistle are resources for pollinators at Badlands. So when you think about controlling an invasive species, it's important to consider their role in the ecosystem they inhabit. 
the effects of removal on pollinator communities are really hard to measure. We don't have a good sense of, of the actual populations of the bee species we documented, just that they were present or not. And we saw them often or not, but who knows what their actual abundance was. This is important, but we don't know how to, I mean, that's very hard. Bark recapture is, is difficult on anything but bumblebees. So we need better methods for assessing pollinator abundance. Nonetheless, we have some evidence that, it, that removing invasive species can matter. And then I want, I want you to think a little bit about how novel interactions, um, what, what do we do about that? So we might have an exotic plant that's sustaining a native insect that wouldn't have been abundant or even there at all maybe prior to arrival of the exotic. Think of Caliopsis under an aformis who's you know, taking advantage of the sweet clover. Um, and this new native interaction partner can now be supporting other vulnerable native plants, which, you know, that's, that's, that's a management conundrum, I think. And what I'm showing you here, this picture is actually taken in my garden. This is um, the endangered bumblebee, Bombus affinis, and it's, my garden is full of native plants, but what's it on? Non-native lamium. So, you know, they, they choose what they choose. So I'd like to acknowledge CCAST for producing this webinar. Um, our funding came from USGS, Northern Prairie Wildlife Research Center, Natural Resource Preservation Program, and the Invasive Species Program. Um, Sam Droby at Patuxent Wildlife Research Center identified all the insects. And I'd like to thank Badlands National Park for logistical support and collaboration. And thank you for listening, and I'll take any questions when we're ready. Thank you, Diane. And thank you, Lauren. Uh, a virtual round of applause um, to both of you. Um, yeah, to, so thank, thank you everybody for listening and for your attention. Uh, we're gonna take just a moment here to, to think about what we heard and draft any questions for ourselves. So I'll give a little 60 seconds of silence here um, and then I'll open it up. We'll start with the questions that we received in the chat and then open it up um, to folks to unmute and ask their own questions. We have, we have about 20 minutes that we'll be here together um, for this discussion. So. Yeah, we'd encourage folks to, to turn on their cameras so that we can see all your beautiful faces um, and have a little bit more of this human to human interaction as we as we try to improve the management of grasslands and the support of pollinators um, in these grasslands that we're all managing. We have a really amazing group of people on the call today. Uh, I see people here from Texas, from California, from up in Utah, Arizona, New Mexico. So we really have a, a broad reach here to be able to think about how what we heard today can inform the management of grasslands and what we can learn from each other. So just take a second to, to keep putting your, your questions in the chat. Keep typing if you're going uh, and putting those questions in the chat chat and we'll kick things off with some of the questions that we heard um, after Lauren's presentation. Colleen, Colleen uh, Roth Grillo, are you on the call with us? You asked the question. I am on the call. Um, I was curious as to whether or not you found in Oregon any uh, species of greatest conservation need when you were trapping bees, including bombas. Yeah, so we did collect some bombus, none that are on, um, you know, the list of special concern. Uh, however, they are supposed to be in those areas. We just didn't collect any. Noted. Thanks. Colleen, is that a is that something that you're concerned with in in your management of grasslands, protecting those SGCNs? <laughs> 
so most of my day job is um, uh, species of greatest conservation need for the Nebraska Natural Heritage Program. So that includes plants, that includes animals, and, and currently there's been a big push for some more bombus research in Nebraska. So they all tie in together. Yeah, yes. so is there anything that you're doing for specifically for pollinators in the grasslands you're managing in Nebraska? I am still learning. So there, there are programs that are going on and there are pollinator plantings that are being put in place and have been put into place and they're being monitored. So we're just now getting a lot of those data into us to find out what we can do with them now. What are the next steps? Right, that makes sense. Thank you so much. Yeah, I just, I would add to that with the, um, right now with like the, spe the species of greatest um, concern or conservation need, a lot of the bee species are only bombus, but we just know so little about any of the, we have 4,000 species of bees in North America. And so we just know so little about which ones actually are rare and, and which ones need the most. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, excellent. We got another question from Valerie Foster. Valerie, are you still with us? I am, Ariel. How are you? Um, I'm off camera today. I'm working in a kind of a remote area, so um, you won't get to see me. <laughs> um, yeah, I was curious, you know, and I might have missed it. I had a question, I think, for Lauren um, or anyone really just kind of on the study date and if you were seeing impacts from ungulates or large hoofed animals or herbivores in your study area um, and, and just kind of what effects, if any, they could be having. I, I'm just kind of curious if that was part of this or not. Yeah, so there are pronghorn and there are elk in the area. Um, their populations are pretty low though. So we don't see them very often. Um, sometimes we'll have like a trap that's been stepped in <laughs> by them. But we don't we don't really see much in this area of them like competing with uh, pollinators for say floral resources or like coming in direct competition with herbivory. That's interesting. And Diane, did you? Did okay, you... thanks for that. Yeah. Sorry, Sorry I, go ahead, Ariel. I think there's a delay. I was just gonna, I was just gonna extend the same question to Diane to see if there, if there are any results from Badlands or around in the surrounding area. I don't think there's any grazing in Badlands National Park, but maybe in the surrounding areas or some comparisons. Actually, there's a big population of bison in the park, um, and there are pronghorn. I've seen a number of pronghorn and uh, both mule and white-tailed deer. So we have, we have browsers, we have grazers. Um, we did do some pan traps and we didn't have them affected by these grazers, which we do in where there are cows. So that's, you know, I, I don't, I don't think we have any kind of a handle on the effect that the grazers might be having on the bees at, at Badlands. Okay, yeah, I might, I might want to follow up with you a little on that. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, um, we're dealing with all, all those ungulates on the for, on the forest, but in particular, I'm kind of thinking of one of our districts where we're managing for bison, and we also have um, a listed cactus species. And um, we do we have started some pollinator studies up there, but we're um, seeing a very depauperate community where this cactus is. And and so then I'm just kind of thinking, you know, kind of what other effects might be, um, yeah, what might be affecting that. Yeah, I, I think one one thing, if, if you've got a concentrated um, bison, for example, herd, that's going to compact the veget, compact the soils, and that can have an effect on the bee communities because they can't really, they can't nest. Most of these are ground nesters, and so they have a harder time getting establishing nests within compacted soils. And a lot of a lot of the ah. of the bees are actually kind of a lot of them specialize in more sandy soils, which compact even more um, 
dramatically. So that would be something to look at. Okay, great. Thank you. I think there's also a CCAST uh, publication also from Oregon that um, I think it was Scott Mitchell who worked with elk in some um, overlap with pollinators. Yeah, Scott Mitchell's work had both, uh, there were a lot of elk, but also cattle um, and looked at the sort of effects of grazing on, on pollinator populations and talked a little bit about deferring uh, phenologically timed grazing. So deferring grazing while there's the most bloom and if that could increase the, if that could beneficially impact pollinator populations. Um, so I encourage folks to, <clears throat> pardon me, to check out those uh, CCAS pub publications on our, on our dashboard. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, yeah, I think that dovetails really nicely into the question that, that Gita just asked. Gita, do you wanna, do you wanna articulate your question? <laughs> sure, yeah. So I was just thinking about the, the bare ground and, um, and uh, I wanted to know if there are thresholds that you see that seem to be enough bare ground. Um, in arid parts of Arizona, we're often managing grasslands to reduce bare ground in order to reduce erosion. And, um, and uh, uh, so it's, yeah, so it's interesting to think that there may be sort of a sweet spot of um, enough bare ground for pollinators, but not so much that you increase your erosion. And now thinking um, that uh, uh, what you're aiming for is enough bare ground that's not compacted as well. So yeah, wanting, wanting to know what you see in terms of how much is enough. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so depending on the bee species, some prefer bare ground, some don't. Um, some like actual, you know, thick litter to nest in. Um, <clears throat> so it's kind of hard to say which, which, which is best, you know, depending on, probably depends a lot on the area and what species are there. Um, in our study, we didn't really see very much bare ground because in the areas that were, you know, of high quality, there were these biological soil crusts that covered any, um, you know, sandy soil, and then in areas that were degraded with invasive grasses, there's just no, you couldn't see anything, it's just complete mat of invasive grasses. I'll ask a follow-up then, will the uh, bees that nest in bare ground, will, um, will they use areas with biological soil crusts? Can, do they just chew through them and nest there anyway, or? I'm sure the answer for some is yes and some is no, but is that a thing? Um, that's a great question. I, I don't know that I've ever heard of one like chewing through the bare, the, the soil crust, but I assume they have to, because how else would they, would they get, you know, access to that soil to build um, like little chambers? That's great. I can imagine uh, David Attenborough narrating that scene right now. That's a <laughs> That'd be amazing. <laughs> great question. Thank you, Gita. Um, we had a couple other questions here for the presenters. Um, let's see, what am I missing here? Yeah, Azalea asked a question about um, monitoring species for, for grassland condition. Azalea, are you still with us? I am. Yeah, my question was uh, pretty general. I just wanted to ask, um, just are pollinators used uh, usually or typically for grassland restoration monitoring? And if not, what other species are traditionally used other than um, pollinators? I think that's a, um, a great question for everybody here who's working in grasslands, but go for it, Lauren. Um, yeah, in, in our area, so Eastern Oregon, um, there's almost no invertebrate monitoring in these arid grasslands. It's all uh, bird monitoring. So looking at like birds of prey or um, some grassland specific birds, and then also, um, vertebrates. So like Washington ground squirrel is one that a lot of groups are um, concerned with. 
but yeah, that's just that area. Yeah, if anybody else has has something to say about what species they're looking at to sort of use as um, the way I'm interpreting your question, sort of uh, interpreting the success of grassland restoration with sort of indicator species. Um, exactly. I'd love to hear from, from some folks uh, in different regions and what those indicator species are. And, and yeah, maybe if if pollinators could be a, a, a useful addition based on how onerous it may or may not be to monitor for these species. Well, I'll jump in and, and just say that I think pollinators would be a great thing to monitor, but the taxonomy is limiting at this point. I think it's really hard to um, to get the resolution you'd want for for pollinators. But at the same time, the the insects are the base of what the birds, many of the birds are are interested in. So I think there has to be that connection ultimately to look at how the trophic levels are improving with restoration rather than just looking at the, the vegetation, which is what we do typically in our, our prairie sites. Yeah, I would just chime in to say that there has been extensive efforts to monitor monarch butterflies, um, which are not a very efficient pollinator, but they do fall under the pollinator umbrella. And they are uh, such a subject of citizen science and people get on board with monitoring for them. So that's been increasing through efforts led by the Monarch Joint Venture in recent years, but that's definitely widespread pollinator monitoring. That's really great. I, I feel like I've heard from some other folks that I've seen on the webinar, uh, their names pop up like uh, Sarah, I'm not sure if Sarah Gandaria is still with us, but talking about using leveraging citizen science efforts uh, for bird monitoring to fill in some gaps when monitoring grassland restoration and shooting for um, maybe less for monitoring the results of restoration, but when um, targeting species in different areas that might they might want to tailor habitat to in restoration projects. Um, you, leveraging that citizen science because the monitoring, as we all know, is a challenge. Um, yeah. Valerie also adds that MODIS is equipped to monitor bumblebees. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, thanks, y'all. There's one other question that I want to ask here before uh, opening up again. We still got a few minutes together. Um, and this question was another follow-up question from you, Colleen, about, um, yeah, I'll let, I'll let you ask the question if you, if you like. <laughs> I can do that, that's not a problem. This one's for Dr. Larson. Are there any specific management practices that you would recommend just based on your studies there at Badlands National Park? Um, well, yes, of course, but I'm not a manager, so take this with a grain of salt. I just do research, um, but I think, um, a lot of a lot of the control that happens um, for a while anyway, I don't know if it still is, but there was helicopter day spray of herbicides. And I think it's important to think about non-target effects of those those broad scale herbicide applications. And I what we saw was that it's really important that there's an alternative resource for the insects when we kill those species we don't want. So I think having some method of, of, of reducing the Canada thistle, which has to be done, I understand that, but then improving the, the alternative resources in a, in a mosaic way so that you actually, I mean, these insects aren't gonna travel that far, especially the little helictids and things. They, they have to have their resources within a you know, fairly local distance. And I think that kind of mosaic management to, to achieve the objectives of invasive species control while providing for the insects is important. Food for thought. Thank you. Thanks, Diane. I, I remember um, Ray Moran's uh, giving really similar recommendations in some of the publications that he's worked with with the NRCS about um, 
the the trade-offs between individual plant application of herbicides and the broad scale applications um, when thinking about pollinator pollinator effects and non-target effects. Um, yeah, and also the pal palatability of many forbs for, for ungulates and whether they're livestock or wildlife. Great. Um, if anybody else has any questions, I'd love to open up the floor here just to, to hear from anybody else, follow up questions or, or any comments when, when thinking about how to apply some of this to your grassland management and thinking about, as Diane really pointed out, that the, the management perspective, you know, when, when taking these, you know, research results, what, is, what does it mean to apply them in the grasslands that we're managing in, in different areas of the, of the Southwest and beyond? Hey, I'll jump in with a, a question I'm, I'm wondering about, um, and it doesn't, doesn't seem like there was really uh, like woody encroachment going on with, you know, any of the, the presentations today, but I'm kind of thinking in, in terms of we're here in Northern Arizona, where, uh, where we're doing a lot of juniper removal and, you know, reducing encroachment, um, wondering, you know, to what extent can that kind of, you know, add like heterogeneity to the landscape? Like, is that, is, is the either uh, are would there be grassland bees that that nest in dead juniper stems they definitely will collect you know litter and maybe a little bit of a different uh floral or you know uh, yeah floristic community um just wondering if like you know are the basically the downed downed dead wood component um could be a a resource for for pollinators or invertebrates in general if anyone has any thoughts or knowledge around that yeah totally um certain species will only nest in, in dead wood or in stems. Um, and so I would assume once you have those, uh, like the decomposing or dead juniper, you're probably gonna have some nice biodiversity of, of the bee community. So not only the grassland species, but also ones that can utilize that those stems. Anybody else who's working at that juniper grassland interface um, have anything to add about that? Well, yeah, and if, if not, thank you for the, thank you, Lauren. You know, I think uh, as we, you know, we just, I think there's a lot of discussion around here about sort of the value of keeping those on the landscape versus, you know, piling and burning basically and i've always suspected you know i think in general we perceive them as as adding if nothing else you know wind breaks and useful useful for you know grassland reestablishment. but um i would have to assume that there is a variety of values with those um so yeah well thanks for the response thanks yeah thanks for the question jesse i think it it sort of adds really nicely to what folks were saying about creating that mosaic on the landscape um, and thinking about where we're where we might be leaving juniper to act exactly as those windbreaks for a more erosive soil type, um, maybe somewhere where there already is a, a, some existing bare grounds. Um, we're working on a on a case study with managers from Big Bend National Park who use that down woody material to reinvigorate the sort of banded vegetation patterns that had been uh, had been disappearing in their sort of low lying grasslands there. So I think that um, when we're thinking about what we're doing where on the landscape, using juniper trees, using downed wood, leaving juniper trees selectively, things like that could definitely be applicable. Well, thanks folks. Um, we're coming up to the top of the hour. Uh, we want to respect people's time, uh, so if you have to, if you have to leave, uh, feel free to to log off. If you have any other additional questions, um, Lauren, Diane, do y'all have a little bit of extra time to stay and ask any additional answer any additional questions? Cool. So yeah, we invite people to to keep asking questions if they have anything that that's on their mind, um, as as Diane and Larson and and the rest of the group who's still here, 40, 45 or so of us. Uh, yeah, might be able to answer any questions or, or think through any any struggles that folks have when they're thinking about supporting pollinators in, in the grasslands they manage. <laughs>